Hello, I'm without my home media minefield branding today, which is a bit of a shame, but uh, hello and welcome to Home Media Minefield Presents. Let's see what's out there live, an entertainment live stream and podcast that focuses on movies, TV shows and related media. My name's Keith Isles. I'm an independent filmmaker, content creator, and a lifelong enthusiast of cinema, television drama, and all sorts of related things like that. So uh, if you're new to the channel, uh, and this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, please do get, indeed get involved in the live chat if you've got any questions for either myself or my special guest, who I will introduce in a moment. Um, we on this channel, we do live streams, as I said, based around movies and TV franchises. We also do physical media reviews, so DVDs, Blu-rays, 4Ks, that kind of thing, along with some explained videos and all sorts of content. So please check it out. If it looks like your sort of thing, uh, consider giving the video a thumbs up and a like and subscribing to the channel. And remember to hit the bell icon so that you get informed of all of this good stuff that we're doing and you don't miss out. So um, I'm pleased to say last year I did, I sell it, I've, I've been doing these series celebrating movies that I grew up with and enjoyed that had anniversaries. And last year I celebrated 60 years of the film Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock's classic. And uh, obviously, I saw reruns of that on TV when I was a kid, and it's what got me into Alfred Hitchcock. And I was delighted last year that I was joined by the author Stephen Rebello, who wrote the book Alfred Hitchcock and the Making of Psycho. And we were able to have a discussion about that. So, um, you know, when you're finished with this video, check that out if that's your sort of thing. But I'm so delighted today to be joined by a guest from sunny California celebrating Thanksgiving currently and we're going to talk about another film that's having an anniversary it was Steven Spielberg's first film Duel which came out in 1971 and I am delighted to be joined by the author of the book Steven Spielberg and Duel the making of a film career author historian and filmmaker, Stephen Ewalt. Welcome, Stephen. Hi there, Keith. I, um, I want to cancel this interview and go watch your uh, Psycho podcast <laughs> with, with Stephen now. He's fantastic, and that's, that's a great book that he wrote, of course. It is. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. It was, uh, it was an honor to, to, to have him involved last year, and um, uh, I was a little bit more rusty. I'd only just started doing the live streams, and... I was a little bit rusty at the format at that point, but uh, but it was a delight to talk to him and uh, you know reminisce on that on that absolute classic. So um, uh, and and obviously I've read your book as well, um, and you know look forward to having a bit of a chat now um, with regards to uh, well Steven Spielberg's career, but specifically the um, you know. The, the the journey that you took and and I've I've now got on the screen. This is your book, Steven Spielberg and Jewel: The Making of a Film Career. Uh, I remember reading this. It was some years back uh, when it came out, and uh, I was doing some extra work on a uh, movie set. And as you're probably well aware, you know when you do that kind of work, there's a lot of sitting around and waiting for for hours yeah. on end. And I picked up your book and read it cover to cover and learned everything that I wanted to know about a film that, you know, I've been passionate about since I was a, a child and my parents let me stay up late and watch it on a uh, on a movie of the week thing here in the UK when it was when it was run uh, several years after it was made, it was fair to say. But uh uh, I remember at the time I didn't even know what the word dual meant and my or dual, I guess, as you guys say. And my dad yeah. <laughs> and, and my dad explained it to me. So um yeah, I mean, let, let's sort of start, if we may, right back at the beginning. And I just sort of yeah. wondered you as a well, I want to know a bit more about you. Um, you, you know, what your background is. 
apart from being a great author, what else do you do for a living and what your sort of experience is with Spielberg and Jewel in particular? Okay. Um, it's hard to synopsize. I'm, I'm getting up there as the white in my beard shows. So it's hard to synopsize. I'll, I'll try to. Um, I grew up like yourself, I'm sure. And like probably everybody watching this, um, mad for the movies. Um, in, in the era I grew up, especially because of Steven and his work, uh, George Lucas, um, and then, you know, on and on, Terry Gilliam, uh, Tim Burton later, um, just oh, and all the, the masters, Hitchcock, uh, Stanley Kubrick. Um, so I was just crazy for movies growing up. And um, I unfortunately was just too late for the eight millimeter era. Um, I shot one film on eight millimeter when I was a boy uh auspicious beginnings it was um uh, an eight millimeter loop of um some uh primates at the zoo it was my, it was a pornographic film my first film <laughs> and that's the only thing i shot on eight millimeter um and then uh unfortunately it was the age of half inch video so we shot um silly comedies um one horror film uh zombie film because george romero was a huge influence on me as a boy mm -hmm. and um Finally, in 91, I got my hands on 16 millimeter. I went to film school um, right after high school. And um, so I started making films on 16 millimeter film and I learned to shoot and cut on that. And um, now for decades, I've been uh, slowly pursuing a, a career as a screenwriter and um, a filmmaker. I have a short film that's about to play in a Canadian comedy film festival um, right. within a matter of weeks, uh, The Mundanity of the Christ. And um, all during this time, I, uh, I was working on three different film degrees over two decades. I got my undergrad in um, film, and then I uh, received a master's degree in uh, cinema studies, history specifically, but also theory. And then I've been working on an MFA in film direction until recently, which I'll, I'll get to that because it ties into the Spielberg connection. Um, during the time uh, that I was after my undergrad and um, into my graduate degree, my um, master's degree, I uh, it was 2000. I thought, oh, the internet. I, I like this for talking about movies with people. So I thought, well, what's the thing I'm most passionate about in film? And I I thought, well, I'd like to make a website on Steven Spielberg's work because he's meant so much to me since I was oh, probably about five years old with Close Encounters. And um, so I spent a year writing and building a, a website, learning basic HTML back then, things like that, a website called SpielbergFilms.com. <clears throat> Excuse okay. me. And um, I launched that in the summer of 2001, along with, um, it's when AI and Jurassic Park 3 came out. Mm -hmm. So I... Um, I ran this website, Spielberg Films, for almost a decade, and um, eventually I closed it down as I was finishing my, um, my, my master's degree because I wanted to write a book, finally. <laughs> um, during the run of the website, before I get to the book, um, I, uh, DreamWorks Pictures then, because uh, DreamWorks and Amblin, but DreamWorks was prevalent at Stevens Company then, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I somehow made contact with them. They reached out to me having recognized the website and I got to know, <clears throat> excuse my voice, Marvin Levy, um, Stephen's um, longtime uh, publicity rep, and then his assistant at the time, Christian Stark, who rose up through the ranks from um, uh, Marvin's assistant to um, eventually she was my boss, which spoiler, <laughs> I, I wind up at Amblin. Um, okay. So um, got to know them and then about, um, Five years into the run of the site, I received a FedEx letter in the mail on uh, Valentine's Day <laughs> of 20, uh, 2006. I see it's from DreamWorks. I'm like, wow, what's this? Open it up, and it's a letter. At the bottom, I see the signature before I read anything else. It says Steven Spielberg. Actually, it says, your fan, Steven Spielberg. So I fell to my knees and started crying because <laughs> this, this man was my... Um, the biggest inspiration to me as a boy, his creativity, um, the yep. imagination and kindness he showed as, as, a, as a young man. It, it, he was a good role model. And um, so Stephen had written me a letter. And this is 
a kid who never bothered writing him a letter to say, you know, gosh, your work means the world to me. Um, I didn't want to bother him. I was too shy about that stuff. So he wrote me a letter to tell me that he'd been a regular reader of my site. And it was the only site he'd go to whenever he wanted to find out what the buzz was about him and his work. And um, he said he was a fan of my writing. <clears throat> so after that, I lived in, in a constant panic knowing he was reading everything. <laughs> I didn't. I was, I was very happy with that. And um, I wound up meeting Stephen that year for the first time and interviewed him for the website. And then um, things went on. And as I finished my master's degree, I thought, I want to I wanna write something more concrete than, than you know, articles online. So mm -hmm. I pitched um, Amblin and DreamWorks the, uh, the idea of a book on dual. Mm -hmm. The reason I started with that was because it's, it's essentially Stephen's first, you know, landmark um, in his yeah. career. I think he's, he did a lot of fascinating, um, or a good handful of fascinating television work before that, but Duel was the one that put him on the map, so to speak. Yeah. And um, right away, Stephen approved it. Um, he uh, opened his archives up to me, which was uh, phenomenal. And um, then he invited me out here. I, I'm from Chicago. He invited me out here to um, meet at Amblin and interview him for the book. And oh my lord, that was very thoughtful of him, of course. Yeah. And um, so that book took a couple of years. I got to interview <clears throat> Stephen, of course, is the core interview in it. And then um, thankfully, I got to talk to Richard Matheson, uh, the the author and screenwriter of Duel, before he passed. And then um, uh, a number of crew members. Um, Sid Scheinberg, uh, Stephen's mentor at Universal, who yeah. essentially, excuse me, I need water because I'm sure everybody's like, God, his voice. <laughs> One second, please. Right. It sounds great. By the way, uh, talking of drinking, uh, just a little deep reference here, but I'm drinking <laughs> from my Chuck's Cafe mug, which is actually the cafe that uh, David Mann, the Dennis Weaver character, uh, stops off in. <laughs> so there you go. I thought let's have something themed to the event. <laughs> and it's and it still stands. The exterior looks the same. I'll I'll interrupt my other story for one second. Oh right, um, sorry. <laughs> right before the pandemic, I've I moved out to Los Angeles um, because uh, Amblin asked me to come work for them. Um, I built their uh, their website, new website that's been up for a couple of years, and I um I write and edit for that, and um, I write their uh, social media. Um, so I'm the fool behind their official uh, social media channels. Um, uh, right before the pandemic, my best friend out here took me out to Chuck's. It's now a French restaurant, but the facade still looks really mostly the same. And it's, it's, it's something uh, crossing the road like David did after, you know, he stumbles across the road. And, um, so we had a nice dinner there. But before the main courses of the French meal came out, uh, my friend, uh, writer Joe Fordham, he um, wrote for Cinefix for two decades, um, right. wonderful publication, wonderful writer. Um, he, he had the chef uh, make me a, um, a Swiss cheese sandwich on rye, just like David orders. And they brought it out and it was a lot two of Two glasses of water, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so that was very thoughtful. And it was like, uh, yeah, and it was it was big geek out moment but it was really something standing in the restaurant and like you know finding the the vantages where steven and, and the crew set up for certain shots and everything it was uh it was really really something not not like i'm a big um you know there's people who go to locations and replicate but yeah. um yeah it was neat to think that uh, you know oh my god almost at that point almost 50 years ago this young kid is making this film that we're still talking about to this to this very day so um it was yeah. it was a neat trip so if you're out in uh in los angeles um i suggest eat at chuck's or uh, the, the french restaurant that's there in its place now i'll be doing that anyway i'm sorry <laughs> that I, i'm sorry that i derailed the story no, no 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 i'm and i <laughs> i ramble and i babble hopefully this is entertaining still so back to um uh the book it um it came out in hardcover in 2014, uh, got a soft cover in 2016. And um, after that, I um, decided to go back and get my final, my uh, terminal degree in MFA in film directing. Mm -hmm. And um, I finished all the work in that. And I was at the point of um, starting my thesis film 
um, to finish the degree. And Amblin asked me to come out and work for him, which catches us up to that story. Wow. And so um, it, it was a life changer. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be, you know, writing um, for, for Stephen now and, and uh, the past films and all the new films that Amblin Partners uh, is putting out under Amblin Entertainment and DreamWorks Pictures. It's um, work I've been doing uh, essentially for 20, 20 plus years now. And um, now it's uh, doing it for Steven instead of just about, sorry, dropped my headphone. <laughs> so instead of just about him, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice, I, li I like the work. Um, I think that catches us up on everything. I don't know if I missed well, anything. I mean, <laughs> that, 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 that's, that in itself is very exciting. And uh, I'm feeling like, wow, I'm, I'm, one, I'm one degree away from Steven Spielberg by talking to you. So this is amazing. <laughs> um, but I mean, just, just to go even further back, if you like. So sure. um, because if, if, if I sort of tell you my side and then, and then I, I'd like to hear your side by contrast. So okay. for, for me, um, you, you know, because I say we're a podcast that talk about movies television and related media and kind of dual if you like is the combination of all those three things because it was a movie of the week for television and it was adapted from a short story as you already said by Richard Matheson um you, you know for the screen so it's kind of that unique combination but the weird thing is for me is much like you I, I grew up with Raiders of the Lost Ark was the film that when I was a you know, 10 year old or whatever, that was the film that made me interested and want to be a filmmaker. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. I love Star Wars and all that stuff. Uh, I, I was a little bit too young for, for Jaws and Close Encounters. I caught those things later. But um, I remember that here in the UK, before I even saw the film Raiders Lost Art, probably a couple of years before I saw it on video, um, on television, they had two one hour long documentary. One was Making of the Raiders of the Lost Ark and the other was Great Movie Stunts yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark, which was hosted by Harrison Ford. And I Memories, take... Friends and 8 by 10 Remember hey, that yeah, song? Memories, Friends and 8 by 10 And so I recorded <laughs> those on VHS because of that old, yeah. Um, recorded them <laughs> and they were on the same tape that I had Star Wars on. And that tape mm. literally I wore out through watching and watching. But this was the first time I, I saw this man, Steven Spielberg at work. And what I didn't realize was maybe a year or two before that, when I was very young, as I said, I was that young that I had to have what the word dual was explained to me. And it was a, it was a Friday night. So it wasn't a school night and I was allowed to stay up late, but my dad was a fan of McLeod, which starred Dennis Weaver, which was also a movie that came from a movie of the week thing before, you know, by Glenn A. Larson and whatever. And and, and a uh, non-official adaptation, of course, of um, uh, Cougan's Cougan's Bluff. Bluff. Yeah, 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 it was it was the uh, again big big Eastwood fan, but yeah. yeah. So um, uh, and he let me watch this, and I remember I was I had, this was obviously before I knew what a director was, and before I knew who Steven Spielberg was. It was you know a few years later, Catching Raiders, putting two and two together. But um, I remember just being absolutely gripped by this film, you know, uh, I, I, and and I just I just couldn't believe it, and I it, the way it made me feel, you know, as a child who had no real life experience then, but it still there was something about it that still got to me. And I, I'm now like, a, you know, as an adult, I've always been, I've always loved road trips. I've, I've, you know, I love driving, um, you know, and I just wonder whether all these things sort of come from, from, you know, what that film did to me at an impressionable age. I don't know. That's, so, that's so funny I'm because um, you've the, the, the film should make you not like driving. Yes, <laughs> And and when I uh, when I was researching and wrote the book, um, I essentially was a non-driver. My um, my wife at the time drove us everywhere because I had uh, I, I I had all my life bad anxiety, and I thought how funny that the first book I'm writing is on something that I'm terrified of driving. 
<laughs> and now since I moved out to LA, I, I, um, I have to drive because the nature of the city is so um, spread out. And uh, I love driving now. But when I'm on the LA highways, which don't really bother me anymore, I think I'm becoming more zen in my older age. Um, whenever there's a semi anywhere near me on the LA freeways, you know, you can't help, especially when the damn thing shows up in your rear view, <laughs> yes. you can't help but think of dual. And um, that's unnerving. And that's one of the wonderful things about dual. I think it, it doesn't have the same reputation and power that Jaws has with making people fearful of um, the, the ocean or even um, some people say swimming pools. But um, I, I just love, um, you know, the word always used for Jaws is primal. And I think dual is definitely the same way where it just taps into these things that uh, he's, he's, I think Steven's done a lot of damage to um, uh, driving and, and swimming, <laughs> just these <laughs> basic things. Um, so it, it, it's pretty funny that, um, you know, this, this nice man, a nice young man at that time, um, just really, you know, put the screws into these things and, and it, 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 they stuck with people where you can't not think of, of dual or jaws when you're doing, you know, associated activities. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, before we, before we actually go into dual itself, again, it's, it's more of a question about your past. So do you remember, because obviously you'd have seen dual long before you got involved in, in this <laughs> project. Yeah. So yeah. do you remember when you first saw it and, and, and what your experience was of that? Do you have any recollection? I don't. It, I, don't I know it was on television, of course, but it, I was not even born when it, when it aired on, um, on uh, ABC here. I was um, just under two years from being alive. <laughs> so right. I, I, I vaguely remember the first time. You know, there's certain movies that they're so a part of your life that you can't necessarily recall the first time. Duel, I know I saw it on television and I know I saw it with my father and I loved it. Um, but I, at that time, I think I'd already seen easily Close Encounters because that was the first Spielberg film I ever saw when I was very young. That and Star Wars the same year. was just... And then um, I had seen, um, I want to say maybe we'd seen 1941 when it premiered on American television. My, my older brother and I watched it and I love 1941. I have always gotten a kick out of it. And um, my own focus as a writer and director, apart from, you know, the, the hist history work I do on film is um, in comedy. And I, I think people who look at 1941 and, and say, oh, it's a terrible comedy. They don't know from comedy because there's some brilliant, brilliant comedic work throughout that as from a directorial uh, perspective. Not everything gels and it's it's a very particular kind of comedy um but i digress i think it's a great film uh, well it's not a great film but it's a brilliant piece of work in its way and i love it right. um so 1941 i might have seen before it and then of course raiders that's really when things synthesize with me like ah this guy because i i think what you say about um those those two making of documentaries which You'll remember in that era, oh, well, first off, we got those, they were commercially re released together here in the States, and they also played on our PBS networks. Were they? I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. yeah I might. Yeah, I actually have the, the VHS. I'm not going to get up and go get it, but I have the VHS of it still. And I wish right. to God they'd put them on a modern format on cut because they're, you know, Lucasfilm in this case, because they're, they're such great documents of the making of that film and, and the times. And yeah. um. So you'll remember those documentaries. Um, George Lucas was great about, he was like the Peter Jackson of documentaries of their day. The Star Wars films had brilliant documentaries in the same vein. And then, um, uh, of course, um, Close Encounters had that eight minute, I think it was maybe seven, eight minute trailer, which um, eventually showed up on home video. That That was a really... I just, I miss that kind of documentation on, on films where they're, you know, they had film crews out on the set. We still have that in EPK material, electronic yeah, press kit material, but yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. It's not that kind of um, observational form of documentary, which is something that I hoped 
to bring to the dual book and, and the other work that I'm working on now. Um, right. Even though I wasn't obviously on the location for dual, I by by talking to these the men who made it, um, getting their memories, I, I hope to impart where the reader almost feels like they're there watching the, the yeah. film being made. And and I, I think that influence now that I'm talking about it comes from the documentary work from back then, which um, Frank Marshall, uh, co-founder of Amblin Entertainment, That's and, right. and um, he he had a big hand once once he was working with Stephen. He had a big hand in uh, the Temple of Doom documentary, which was equally great. Yeah. And um, uh, someone I'm I'm proud to call my a friend now, Mick Garris, who was um, he he first started working with <clears throat> Stephen and Amblin on uh, Amazing Stories, the original Amazing yes. Stories. And yes. Mick did the, the Gremlins and Goonies documentaries. They were shorter, but um, God, you know, talking with anybody in this case yourself, Keith about that era makes me, um, it makes me feel young again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, uh, it, on, the, on the thing about the, because um, I agree with you, those are great documentaries. On the, uh, obviously, my channel, Home Media Minefield, one of, the, one of the things, or the main thing that this channel does is looks at physical media releases. Yeah, Blu-ray and DVD and 4K, et cetera. And um, I'm pleased to say that the Indiana Jones collection, uh, that's, that's available on Blu-ray. Um, the making of Raiders of the Lost Ark, that documentary, is actually on it. Uh, that in the archive parts. Um, the full, the great, full movie, great movie stunt Raiders isn't, but making I didn't of Raiders. Remember? Okay, I didn't remember uh, that. Shame on me. Yeah, um, no, it's, it is. It is available still, which is okay, great. Very but, good to know. But I, I, I remember. I remember loving great movie stunts one because, you know, that was hosted by Harrison Ford as well. And, uh, you know, that looked at the that wasn't just Raiders. It looked at the sort of history up to that point of cinema um, with in relation to action and stunts and sort yeah. of brought it up to Raiders, didn't it? So first you know. place I remember hearing about Yakima Knud on um, yeah. John Ford stagecoach, which yeah. obviously Raiders and the truck chase has the the tribute and, and, and influence of stagecoach and that amazing stunt can it did. So yeah. um, it goes to show you um, those documentaries were important in ways that electronic press kit type documentaries aren't because even there is teaching a film history. I, mm. I had, didn't see stagecoach until I was in film school itself. Oh yeah. And, uh, I'm pretty yeah. sure, but, but I knew who Yakima Knut was and I knew of the film because of that. So yeah. um, no, they, exactly, they were... exactly the same here. I learned, so much, uh, you know, at, at, at a very young age, so much about filmmaking and film history just through watching and watching this. And this was, I said, ironically, before I even got to see Raiders itself, because it didn't come out on, on video for a couple of years after that here in the UK. So oh. it was the first it was the first sell through VHS tape that I ever got was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, um, that's great. Uh, but but um... you know it's a digression again. But I hate back in in the seventies and eighties. Um, I always hated hearing about fans in the UK not getting the films. Sometimes and like like ET for instance, we had that in the summer of eighty two. That that is the summer of nineteen eighty two for me. That and Poltergeist. Yeah. And um, you didn't get ET until um, Boxing Day or Christmas um, in in eighty two or eighty three. Uh -huh. I, my, it must well put it this way. I mean, I know that my mum took me to see it. Okay, um, and and I, I remember it. So it must have been. I, I would I would imagine there's a lot of things that when I look at the year and I think to myself, my God, did I see it then? And then I realise <laughs> here in the UK we often got things not like nowadays simultaneous, but sometimes we'd get things maybe a year later. Sometimes I think I think we had a new hope. Star or Star Wars as it was, I think yeah. we got it in seventy eight in the UK, where it was seventy seven over over yeah. in something like that. But it was the same. I, I always hated there. that. I felt I felt um I felt angry on the behalf of you and your your um your your fellow um uh, Britons because uh and and it still rankles me. I think uh, I don't fully understand that even in this day and age that you know why not a worldwide release because first it's cheaper for marketing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not to have to, to start a campaign up again I'm, I'm assuming in, in different territories um 
Yeah, I, I love the idea of to a, make money uh, in, it's to make money in different ways, though, isn't it? But yeah, uh, well, it, I think it's that, but I think it might also be, um, you know, legal. Uh, it's easy as a fan to get impatient or upset about things, but um, like releases or why isn't this out? Um, but you know, the the legal matters behind things, even something down to like a still of a, an actor, their rights tied into it. That um, and I know this all too well going after um stills for ambulance films like with the with the studios it can be very complicated business sometimes and yeah it's, eh, the lawyers blame it on the lawyers <laughs> it's, always, it's always about the lawyers lawyers yeah lawyers and marketeers run the whole thing yep, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean you know i was really grateful here in the uk growing up um we would get old movies of the week um, played like on a Friday night. And uh, mm -hmm. we had this thing called, I've mentioned this before on other podcasts and live streams. Um, we had a, a series of, well, it wasn't a series, but it came under a banner called Murder Mystery Suspense. Mm -hmm. And this was how I first saw Duel. It was how I first saw Psycho. It was how I first saw The Man Who Haunted Himself, which is another film that I love with Roger Moore. Um, and they used to have things like the sort of TV movies of Startsky and Hutch and McLeod and <laughs> Six Million Dollar Man. You know, all of those things that were actually, you, you know, made for television, but they, they they would kind of put them on as this sort of movie of the week. Um, oh, that was that was a universal uh, speciality. In, in fact, even... Um, the Africa, well, of course, Duel special compared to, to most TV fair at that time, but Duel famously, it was the UK that made Duel's reputation and Stephen's reputation yeah. essentially. But um, yeah, Universal was great at like, you know, packaging two, three episodes together and putting it into the theaters in the UK, even which as a boy, when you'd read about those things in Starlog or Fangoria, it's like, Huh, I wouldn't mind seeing that projected up on the big screen. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's the it's the incredible Hulk, but I've watched it on the big screen. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. And particularly here in Europe, we used to get a lot of those things released as you know, some well, dual, which we'll get into, had extra material so it could be sold as a theatrical film in Europe. And um yeah, you know, I've previously done this is the still book Blu-ray, and mm. uh I've done a on this channel, I've done a, a full review of it. And um, it does include some nice special features, including interviews with Spielberg and Richard Matheson. Um, and uh, the only thing that I wish it did is I wish it had the, as well as the theatrical version in widescreen, I wish it had the TV version in four to three with a mono soundtrack. That would have made yeah. it perfect, you know, so you had both. And <laughs> I, if I had any influence over that at all, I think, um, first off, I, I really, I, I wish Universal would have taken this uh, 50th, 50th anniversary, because that's a big landmark. I wish they would have taken the time to um, put a UHD uh, release of the film out. Uh, and um, the, the, the greatest package I could think of that they could do when it does come to UHD is the theatrical film in um, the proper aspect ratio, um, and then the TV edit, and um, I and, and maybe some more substantial. Um, I mean, the the documentaries that Laurent Bouzereau did for the the release are are very good. Um, yeah. But yeah, maybe some more substantial material. Which um, there is a documentary coming out from um, Europe. Um, the the directors uh, based in Spain. Uh, it's called The Devil on Wheels. That's going to be coming out, I presume, within the a year, two years, maybe, depending. So there's a feature length documentary that is coming out about Duel. Yeah, I, I, love I, this. I met somebody who was involved in that. Um, and, and I was extremely envious because I sort of said, well, that's exactly the sort of documentary I'd like to make, you know. And yeah. I like, Damn, I'd love to be involved. But uh yeah, I understand that they they sort of visited all the locations and they've talked to the composer and you, you know anyone else who's still alive basically. Um, yeah, do stuff. But I, I often thought, I mean, I've got a picture there at the 50th anniversary Blu-ray edition. Beautiful artwork. And it is beautiful artwork. But you know what? I I did sort of think it's a shame they didn't like ask you to do a 
audio commentary or something on it would have been oh, amazing. Because uh, yeah, Stephen doesn't Stephen doesn't have any. Of course, fans he know doesn't do he them. doesn't have any audio commentaries on his own work. And if anybody's going to do an audio commentary over Stephen's work, it should definitely be Stephen and no one else. Although it would be cool to hear. I mean, imagine him talking with uh, George Lucas and Harrison Ford over the indie pictures. That would oh, be a dream. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be amazing? Never going to happen. Never going to happen. Yeah, in, in, in... He kind of feels that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I know he's never done commentaries. And is, is it, I'm sure I saw him in an interview once saying that, he feels it kind of gives away the, the the movie magic by explaining everything. Is is, is that um, correct? I think he said more so. He just said he doesn't want to um, interrupt the experience of the film itself by him talking over it. Which it's like, and 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 someone I, it might have been Empire Magazine. They humorously called called him out on that because Stephen talked about screening. Um, I, I don't remember if it was Lawrence of Arabia or if it was some other David Lean films, but it, Lean was out. I'm pretty sure to Amblin and in the screening room, they put some, one of his pictures up at least. And Lean talked over it, telling Stephen, you know, details about scene by scene. And, and I think it was Empire. They said, Hey, but you, you got to enjoy David Lean doing that. And he said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. There, right. well, and I, the, I irony is, the irony is as well when, I mean, this is one of the things I love about Spielberg so much is when he is interviewed um, and I've been lucky enough to actually you know, be at a screening where he's done a Q&A afterwards in person, you know, and it's like, wow, there he is. But with, which, with, which film? Which film? Yeah, was oh, it was um, Bridge of Spies a couple of a few oh, years back. And yeah, uh, yeah. Back I like that one. And he came and did a and a which was incredible. Um, but, uh, you, you know, all of his documentaries and, and even the stuff he's done on the disc here of, of uh, Duel. Yeah. He when he talks, he really gets into it and loves it. Yeah. So you, you do sort of think. Actually, you'd be amazing for an audio commentary, but uh, he'd but be one of the best, I think, because he's so generous and open in how he talks about things. And I could see one point. I, you know, I, I can't speak for him, but just reading, observing him over decades and decades now, um, I think one thing. Stephen, speaking of generous, he's very generous in the fact that. He doesn't try to say, this is what this film is about, period, as a filmmaker. Um, I think he's always, always been very, um, he doesn't want to, he seems not to want to do that and to, to let audiences, you know, make, which, which is what art is about, of course. Um, mm. Sometimes people come up with insane theories and, you know, it's like, did you watch the picture? But, <laughs> but they still stand um, if that's what a person takes from the film you know that's good that's it that's their experience of it and i think he seems to be always hesitant you know to staple something down but that aside like just to hear production stories scene by scene what a gift that would be i wish we had it on everything you've ever done but i'm greedy like that <laughs> yeah no me too i mean i have to say um you, you know lo long before ever going to film school and whatever it was definitely Steven Spielberg that made me then discover uh, David Lean and Alfred Hitchcock. And, you, you know, it, it was through him referencing those. So it's a lot like Scorsese, whenever Scorsese yeah. talks and he references so many films oh, and Tarantino yeah. does as well. Right, and I'm right down kinda, that list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm always scribbling down because there's always something that I'm unaware of, even though, you know, you end up thinking you've seen loads of films and then you think, well, actually, I've barely scratched the surface, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's so many great ones out there. but uh, uh, Too many, too many. The, the, and the older, not to keep talking like I, you know, in my cups, or not, excuse me, not in my cups, in my um, elderly years here. But, um, you know, the older you get, I, uh, I think, God, there's, there's not enough life left for all the films I want to see, all the novels I want to read, all the music I want to listen to again and again. Um, yeah, it's, if there's one bad thing in the design, <laughs> if, if yeah. you believe in design of this all, um, damn it, they didn't take movies into account. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, t t 250 year lifespans would be good. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and probably not enough still to, still not to, enough hear, all the, yeah, yeah. to hear all the great stories, to, to um, study them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so if we get into um, 
if we get into Duel then. So obviously Spielberg at this point, um, he he was working at Universal and he had been directing things like Night Gallery and Columbo. Is that right? Yeah, uh, correct. Kind of where he was where he was at at this point. And then he got uh, this- And Columbo was just before Duel. Uh, Columbo, right. Murder, Murder by the Book, which... It's the I, pilot, isn't it? Is that the TV movie? No, no, no. Uh, well, yes and no. It's a weird thing. Columbo um, had two TV films. Uh, the first one, I believe, was in 68. Maybe even the first two. Right. And then the series, um, it wasn't a proper series, uh, network series back then of like 22, 26 episodes. It was in this thing. Um, I can't remember the title of it, but it was like the, the mystery movie of the week type of thing. Right. And it, it was like a, an omnibus of rotating um, series, mini series, um, where one week you'd get a Columbo, the next week you'd get whatever else was in this this omnibus. And um, so Stephen's uh, film Murder by the Book was the first one in that proper omnibus. And But before that, there were two other um, telefilms that were made with the character. Um, but Murder by the Book, um, it's thankfully because of home video and, and Columbo being available digitally and streaming now, I think more people are seeing it. Mm-hmm. But God, that I, uh, I, I think there's some episodics that he did before that that are, are sadly unavailable and need to be. And I've actually proposed um, through my uh, old boss at Amblin, I proposed, could we at least get a digital box set of um steven's work with universal out there um even sid scheinberg yeah when i talked to sid Sid scheinberg for uh the dual book sid even said um you know it's it's baffling to him the studios they sit on these big libraries and the fact that they haven't they, they don't release certain things and again it could be because legal it could be because they need expensive restorations and they might not see um you know, the dollars and cents don't make sense. They they don't think they can recoup the cost for restoration. I, I don't know what it is, but this is Steven Spielberg. He's one of the greatest filmmakers of the entire medium in its history. So um, he did two episodes for a series uh, that starred Roy Thinnes called The Psychiatrist. And oh. um, one of them in particular, par for the course, I wish people could see that because there's some beautiful dramatic work in it. And, um, you know, in Stephen's early career, after Jaws in particular, in Close Encounters, I think he even said he didn't want to be seen as the um, truck and shark director. Or, I, I, God, you know, I think critics back in his early career, they really underestimated him because his, his films became hugely popular. So, oh, if it's popular, it must not be, you know, art. But I think um, you look back, this is a guy in his early 20s. And some of the, again, dramatic work in um, Par for the Course, the psychiatrist, is so intuitive and in tune with um, the human experience. You know, it, it's, it's very shockingly um, sensitive and, and, and empathetic, I think, to, um, in this case, it's a story about death. Mm-hmm. And it's from this 20-something kid. Yeah, and yeah. so I... I desperately want people to be able to look at his early work. And I don't know if he's hesitant. I've never talked to him about it, but um, I'd like to, because I, I want to get those out there. If, if I can whisper in anybody's ears. Um, yeah. And um, he, you know, when you look at Duel, everybody cites it as his first TV film, which by definition it is, but Columbo Murder by the Book is maybe two minutes less, I think, running time. It's a sense ostensibly a feature film yes. and it's a great one. It's a yes. great story. Yeah. And then um, even before that, he had a sci-fi film for one of the strange universal omnibuses called uh, Los Angeles 2017. And um, it's not, it's not hugely successful, but it's got a lot of interesting work in it. And um, it's a feature length story. Um, that's part of this ongoing rotating um, series, but it's, it's a, it, it works as a standalone and it's written by Philip Wiley who wrote um, One World Collide. 
the wow. you know the original. Too bad they and, didn't um, release that four years ago, isn't it? Really, <laughs> it would have been ideal, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's it's very dated, but I love that too because I love seeing. I, I'm a sucker for American well, films in general, not just American. 1970s. It's my favorite era for film, but just yeah. to see um, the roots of of Spielberg's work, and then also um, he was a big fan of L.A. Or excuse me, he was a big fan of of Lucas's THX 1138 before he even met George. And I think there's some interesting similarities where it's like, did this influence this or is it just happenstance? Um, so I think these are things that people need to see. And I really think they'd appreciate them almost A is building blocks to see a style developing within a filmmaker. And then also just to go, son of a gun, who is this man? Where does he come from? He, he's uh, in his early twenties and he has this, ineffable innate sense of the camera uh, the frame moving the camera um resetting the frame within the moving camera not just you know cut 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 um mm -hmm. even cutting his cutting was very special back then i think and um rubbed people wrong in universal television a lot of the time um along with the, the camera work like you know on eyes his first professional work for the night gallery um mm -hmm. there's some really you know, um, unique shots in it that the old hands that, yeah, they, they were like, what's with this kid? And some of them are pretty amazing. Some of them are a little, you know, too much, but he was, it was a great place for him to try things out. And it's mm -hmm. fascinating to look at all this early work leading up to Duel even. And I think all that work made him ready for Duel as well. So, yeah, ready to seize that important. opportunity. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because well, yeah. the good news here was he was, because he was such a fan of the Twilight Zone, he was already a fan of Richard Matheson's work, right? Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. so that was kind of, I, I guess, because is it right that his, his, his secretary or something um, found the, the story for yeah. him and said... It was um, it's, uh, Nona Tyson, uh, his... His secretary at the time, although when I talked to Stephen for the book, he he corrected himself and he said, now it's administrative assistant, but she was his secretary at the time. Yes, and cool. um, I, I think Stephen said something along the lines that she really had my number as far as um, understanding his his interest, his taste. And um, sweet old lady or older lady. And she um, read the story for Duel in the April 1971 issue of Playboy magazine. Right. And um, Stephen was like, no, no, what are you doing with a Playboy? <laughs> but um, and and if you've not seen that issue, um, there's a piece of art in it, a uh, two page spread accompanying Duel. It's the, the opening. It's beautiful. Okay. And it's it's yeah, it's really, really great. So that was April 71. She brought that to his attention. He jumped on it, found out who the producer was. Um, got the producer to look at um, Columbo Murder by the Book, which is like, thank God he had that in his pocket because, yeah, like, yeah, like we've said, it's a great film, and um, and it showed that he was ready for a feature, I think, because it was feature length himself itself, and so um, yeah, he he was a Matheson fan, who isn't from his generation to ours. I mean, he's a master, and um, yeah, it just everything worked out from him being ready for the job. Nona finding this story, this really great story in Playboy magazine, and which as a kid, I used to read Playboy all the time and my yeah. kids would, uh, my kids, my, my friends back then would tease me. They're like, yeah, you read it. Sure. You know, that old joke. It. Yeah. But God, A, the short stories in it, it had Matheson, it had Bradbury, it had so many great story writers and B, the interviews in it, which I always got a kick out of the three pictures at the bottom in black and white, you know, all. Of the, of the interview subject the interviews in that actually i read them so much they were a huge influence on me on doing interview work myself for film history um it was i mean take out all the wonderful naked ladies <laughs> and you still got it was a quality publication back then so thank god miss tyson found that story for steven and um just everything fell into place yeah imagine if, if the producer george Eckstein had said your talented kid, but now nah, we're going to go with this journeyman guy who's 20, 30 years older. Um, yeah. 
Well, it would have been, I mean, again, my understanding from, from what I've read and, and well, in your book probably and, and, and listened to on the, on the interviews on the, um, on the Blu-ray is, uh, you know, the, the normal process back then would have been to have uh, done a load of second unit shooting, but then had the, 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 the close-ups with with rear projection and uh and, and yeah, you know, things that way, process shots and and um you know Spielberg was kind of insistent that if he was going to do this he actually wanted to go out on location and film it for real and he, he managed to get hold of the camera car from bullet and and yeah. stuff like that is is, is that about I, I know I'm probably yeah, that's, that, no that's all that's all accurate and I yeah. think that actually when when you mention that I, I don't know if I've ever thought this directly before but when I speaking of like if if X sign George the producer of Duel if he had gone with an old studio hand because you know Universal was full of them um, things were starting to change where the younger guys like Steven were getting these insane opportunities like never before but um, yeah. if he had gone with like Hitchcock was still shooting up to um, Family Plot in 76. He still had process shots in his films. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing into the late 70s there. Um, and by that time, I mean, you know, you go back and um, in the 50s, there were younger filmmakers doing uh, location work in like New York City and other places. And then Easy Rider, of course. I mean, that's the oh, one, yeah. but a lot, of, a lot of Corman pictures being low budget and other, uh, the, you know, Location work was becoming so much more prevalent, even on vehicles. Mm -hmm. And um, Bullet, of course, obviously, um, being a direct. Um, the idea of doing dual with process shots, that I think the studio would have preferred it at the time, apparently. I think an older filmmaker might have done that, and it would have killed the um, verisimilitude of the picture. I, I don't think it would have been nearly as terrifying if it was... Um, if it was um it had the unreality of what it, what a rear projection shot brings to something yeah in, in that day i think now rear projection sometimes it's terribly lit and you can tell but it's there's some rear projection work now that can be flawless but back then not the case so um yeah. it was the right decision for him to to push and um demand that he, he do it on location and i mean it's this young guy demanding it. I, I just love that. Um, it, it, the picture mattered. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, right down to the. Uh, I've got a little picture there of, um, you, you know, the car and the and the truck, and it was it was right down to the that the casting of the vehicles, even right before we even get into Dennis Weaver and how great he is. It was, yeah. it, it, you know, he was insistent that he wanted a, a red car so it would stand out in the desert, and and he wanted. There were a number of trucks on the Universal lot, but he chose this one because it kind of had a snout and a face, if you like, and looked more fierce. Is 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 that is that right as well? Oh yeah, yeah. He famously talked about that a number of times. Um, yeah, it's a great truck. I mean, it's you know, uh, a monster movie needs a great monster, and I think um, you know this is this is the. Uh, the Frankenstein's monster or the, the, the mechanical shark of this film. It's, um, it's iconic. And, um, I guess that's a, well, not, I guess I know it's a gut thing. He, he saw that truck and you know, you're my, you're my truck. You got the part kid. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a nasty piece of work. And imagine driving on a freeway and something like that pulling up behind you. Uh, it's bad enough being boxed in by, um, uh, freight trucks. But um, that thing just looks horrible. <laughs> so. yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And, um, you, you know, again, I suppose this was a um, what was kind of unique about this this film at the time was, you know, it was something that essentially was was dealing with, you say, about him getting into human emotions and psychology and. I mean, this was dealing with road rage, right? In, in, yeah, yeah. In, in certain respect. And, um, uh, you know, again, when I saw it when I was really young, I would have never have understood these things. But there was still it was that it was that gut visceral thing that that, that, that pulled you in. And, and I think it was the fact that it looked so realistic as well, because 
you know, as we've discussed, he he, he shot everything for real, yeah, in the desert yeah. with with I, Dennis Weaver doing some of the driving as well, right? So yeah, yeah. I I not to contradict, but I I, I see a lot of people say, oh, it was the first movie to deal with road rage, but I think more importantly, and I think this is why we can watch it as an audience uh, member. Um, the, I, um, I I know there was a book that came out before my book did that I was like, Ugh. but I'm positive. I'm the first person to have brought this up to Stephen, And it was kind of like, he, he got it obviously, but I'd never seen anybody talk about this before. More than Road Rage, it's a film about bullying, mm -hmm. which was a big part of Stephen's childhood. And um, I associated with that because I was bullied as a kid. I'm sure a lot of, all the time, every day, kids are bullied. Yeah. And that feeling of powerlessness that gives you, I think that's the key to Duel. It's about being bullied and feeling like you're alone in the world. And what can I do? The feeling, the terror and the hopelessness of that. And then... Finally, you know, strapping the seatbelt on or pulling your britches up and saying, enough. Sorry to shake the camera there, but I'm. No, no <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I, find, I find that really interesting that you brought that point up, actually, because, you know, I'm an only child. So uh, my parents had me quite late. So um, I, you know, I, I grew up and films and television and things of that were were kind of my my escape and yeah. i was i was also bullied I, you know i wasn't popular at school i was the geeky kid that liked sci-fi you know which uh which is kind of cool now but wasn't then um oh my and, god these kids these kids today don't know how good they have yeah, it. I, exactly. they, they, i'm a nerd when i heard the the word nerd growing up it was usually before i was being chased or punched not exactly. a good word. <laughs> there you go. Star Wars, yeah, Star Wars and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It wasn't, or Star Trek and everything. It wasn't necessarily yeah. <laughs> cool when I was a kid, but it's very cool yeah. now. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, and I find that interesting because the other thing, the other thing, I, I re-watched this again um, a few nights back, ready for this um, conversation, because, uh, funny, funny enough, talking about dates as well and the anniversary. So I did a Halloween um live stream uh, a few weeks back and had some guests on that talking about the halloween franchise but i did mm. it on what was guy Fawkes night over here so i was a week sure. late with it a week i yeah. missed halloween by a week and and i believe we we've missed the actual 50th anniversary of this by one week haven't we wasn't it um like, yeah it was uh on the oh god i should know this like <laughs> i should have it tattooed on my brain but um the 13th of November. Oh, by a but, couple of weeks then, maybe. Yeah, but, maybe. Because yeah, yeah. I, I know um, I reached out to you earlier in the year because I, 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 I wanted to actually. I'm so tie... sorry it takes a while. No, that's to right. Get me. But I, I wanted to tie this in with the 50th anniversary. You know, yeah. that was that was kind of the, 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 the point. But um, but where was I going? I've lost my train of thought. Where was? I... Oh yeah. So I watched it again the the other day, and um, you know, I can always watch this film. I love it. But one of the things. That, that sort of struck me and it, and it struck me because it's a very sort of contemporary thing nowadays is, you know, you watch this film and, and, and apart from the, 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 the fashions and the age of the vehicles and the fact that they have to use pay phones rather than cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> it, it kind of still works and stands up. And it was interesting because one of the scenes that grabbed me um, watching it again this time is the simple scene where he's he's on the phone with his wife, and you know he, he's in a payphone and it's in a in a laundrette, and you see the the, yeah. the ra again brilliant camera framing. You see the door of the uh, tumbled dryer yeah. and whatever open yeah. and sort of frame him. Um, but it, some of this deals with sort of masculinity as well, and and what Absolutely. it and what it kind of. Um, particularly you know when this was set but as i said it, even it's still sort of relevant today and it's kind of like you, you know he was maybe maybe slightly henpecked by by his wife and his wife was upset because the neighbor had made some sort of a you know inappropriate advance towards her and he didn't stand up to him and all of this yeah. sort of thing and i thought to myself again these are things that when i watched it as a kid i didn't really sort of pick up on those things but um I think it's really, I think this film is a lot deeper 
than people give it credit for. Because on face value, it's kind of like, uh, you know, jaws on wheels, isn't it? And it's, you know, and it's, but there's a lot, there's a hell of a lot more going on um, psychologically in this. In this oh, and I think, I think any, any good um, thriller, you know, it, it might look simple. The plot might seem simple, which is a good thing because, um, you know, any good film, any good story, it's, it's all has to be about the underpinnings I think, um, and I that scene was added for the UK release of the theatrical or the international release, and it puts it on a little bit heavier than one would wish. I know Stephen wasn't a huge fan of that scene. That was um, that and the, the bus scene were producer George Eckstein's ideas in particular, and um, it's it's fine. It, it's nice that it you know cuts back to man's domestic life. Um, but I think um, it's it's even even without that, I think it's still obviously a film about um, masculinity and not in the pejorative sense that we hear <laughs> all the time now. Um, but um, this is a man who is a, he seems to be a decent person. He's middle class. He's um, a provider. And um, just this random threat comes out of nowhere. And it's like, you know, again, when you're something horrible falls into your day, it's like, why me? <laughs> what have I done to anyone? So yeah. um, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting, and this, this comes from the Matheson itself, uh, the sh short story even. It's a, um, it's, it's kind of a, what's your metal? Um, you know, let's, let's test it here. And obviously it takes, as we see, man back to a, um, uh, uh, again, a primal state. At, at film's end, he even acts, um, you know, he's up on the hill looking oh, down yeah. at his bested foe. And, you know, he's, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's like he might as well throw thrown a bone into the sky and then we could, you know, cut to the future. It's, it's that it. kind yeah. of, and, and um, it's, um, it's him finding this buried part of his masculinity because masculinity, you know, just like femininity, they're very complex topics. The humans are very complex. And men obviously were built more for, and, and it's what got us to this point in, in our um, societies, um, men are built more for physical aggression. And um, yet most of us <laughs> aren't physically aggressive now due to the nature of our societies, which is a great thing because I don't want to be out bashing anything over the skull to drag it home to eat. I'd rather just have the groceries, even take out, just bring it, deliver it here. <laughs> so, um, and, and I think that's one of the things that it's, it's a great film because of that subtext. And actually, um, Stephen's always equated dual to Jaws in the book. He talks about it quite a bit, you know, it being a corollary. But I think one thing, I don't think I talk about this and I don't know anybody else has that I've seen, but I think a more important thing is when you take Duel and David Mann and you take Martin Brody and um, Roy Scheider, I think there's such a great set of differences and similarities between them. Um, Dennis Weaver isn't, I mean, he's played a lot of cowboys and stuff, but he's not the most, he wasn't the most masculine of figures, even with that fine mustache he wore so much. <laughs> he, you know, he was thin, reedy, his voice itself was reedy. Roy Scheider, of course, worked out constantly. He um, grilled himself in the sun all the time. I mean, he, he was fit, wiry, and um, more of a, the standard portrait of when people say the word masculinity, they think of someone more like that. And yet one of the things that's so great about Brody and Jaws is he's a man's man, as they say, mm -hmm. but he also has weaknesses being human. Um, mm -hmm. He's afraid of the water. He, um, he's made, um, his hands are tied in his duty, uh, not just his duty as a, a, an officer of the law, but in his duty as a, a father, a neighbor, um, in protecting people from the shark, the the um, the institution robs him of his masculinity in a, in that way, and um, or not just masculinity; it's also a nurturing thing, obviously, to be protective. Um, and um, yet, Brody also has things like David Mann, where he has fears. Uh, you know, it's it, it could be an irrational fear, the fear of the water, but you know, the whole death thing 
that's not an irrational fear. And in, in the case of Jaws, Brody has to overcome his, his failings, just like David Mann does. And he has to have that moment of, um, you know, Jaws is essentially a duel, um, even to the, the smile, you son of a bitch moment. It's, um, he, he has to, to prove his mettle again, like, like David Mann does. So, um, and I think that's what always has made Stephen films rich. Um, even when he was doing, you know, fantasy films, uh, sci-fi films with a hook. Um, look at Indiana Jones, the figure of Indiana Jones. The opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think is amazing because of, I mean, it's all exciting, it's creative, but the best thing about that, the core of that is how it introduces the character, or excuse me, the figure, and then the character of Indiana Jones. Absolutely. It, it, um, I, this is a misuse of the word, but I think it progressively demasculates this heroic figure and it humanizes him in doing that. It, the first time we saw, we see this, him in silhouette, I mean, he's a, he's a man, you know, and he's got the quick draw and, you know, he, or excuse me, um, uh, yeah, with, it's, it's with a gun. gun. Yeah. 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 With the gun. And, um, and he's got a whip on his belt and it's like, this guy is going to just be two fisted action. But we slowly see he is a, um, he's a guy with failings. He's making it up as, I hate to use the word failings, but you know, he's, he's yeah, got yeah. more to him than just fist. Obviously he's, yeah. he's intellectual. He's, um, he can be a goof, uh, you know, great Buster Keaton-esque comedy throughout the indie films. Um, he's, he's, um, he's got a good heart. So he's not, you know, in the 80s, I always hated, I don't want to say hated, I was not interested in, in the big action Schwarzenegger, um, Stallone type films. I love movies with character like Indy. And I think that's a hallmark of what Stephen films in general, no matter if it's a drama, a sci-fi, uh, action, comedy, I think... Um, he's always shown a round portrait of relatable human characters with their strengths and, and their weaknesses and needing to overcome things. Um, huge odds usually. Yeah. And um, I think that is the key to what made his films besides great technical skills. I mean, breathtaking technical skills. I think it's always, and this is, this goes for any film, any filmmaker, any storyteller, it's all about character and yeah. relatability. And people, you know, tried to chase the magic of, of Spielberg and Lucas, and they usually thought it was the special effects or incredible sights and sounds. But no, it's, it's about character and humanity. The rest is all just beautiful window dressing. So, um, exactly. yeah, there's a through line. Yeah. No, exactly. He, he's got that balance right of, um, you, you know, technical prowess and use of camera and editing and all of that sort of stuff in movement. But likewise, the heart is always there, isn't it? It's always the, I mean, he, he, he gets criticized for that sometimes, doesn't he? The, the, the schmaltzy sentimentality or whatever, but um, yeah, which I think I, he, important, I, I right? think in the greater scheme, I, that's really stuck with him critically as a reputation. And I don't know that's entirely, fair at all it's like the people who say oh martin scorsese is a gangster film director or a man and it's like my god have you seen the the whole of scorsese's body of work he has he's, exactly there are yeah. fewer gangster films in the in the whole than than you know he's got wonderful women's pictures he he's got all sorts of films he's a genre like steven he's a genre filmmaker yeah and i think that's i think that's one reason the two of them from their um generation that the two of them are the movie brats they're really the last men standing when you think about it and i think it's because they work in so many different genres and you got so many different offerings from them throughout their careers and continue to this day um i mean steven's got a musical coming out in less than three weeks now exactly um, yeah, yeah. So, story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I should have, as, as uh working for amblin i should have said it in that way um yeah so well, um and, and of course, a, you know, Robert Weiss, another great film director of his time, has obviously yeah. you know, done a fantastic uh, original of that. So it'll be good to see what Spielberg brings to it, I think. You know? Yeah. And, and of course, um, not to go off on that too much, but um, 
West Side Story, Stephen's adaptation is an adaptation of the stage play and the, the book and the musical. And excuse me, the stage musical, I should say, but from the book and the musical, not an adaptation of Wise's film, although, right. and, and Jerome, Jerome Robbins as well, to be fair. But I think um, it'll be interesting to see if he has any visual nods or just little bits to it, besides, you know, Rita Marino's in, this, in the new film as, as a different character, of course. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated because, um, you know, Stephen's been... Um, wanting to and in the case of those who don't like musicals threatening to do a musical since the 1970s um yeah. 1941 the um uh sing 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 sequence is phenomenal and mm -hmm. it is a set piece like few others in his in his uh, filmography and then yeah. obviously the beginning of temple of doom with the anything goes Oh, which is amazing. Chaos. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Oh, that devolves into chaos, I should say. Which no, I, it, love. It, I love Temple of Doom and I love that sequence. But even before that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Stephen was developing in the late 70s a film called Real by Real, which was a musical. And um, uh, I, I believe he was developing it for Universal and they passed on it. We could have had a Spielberg musical back in the late 1970s. Oh, wow. <clears throat> but yeah. well, at, least, at least he's doing it now. I mean, I do love it when these filmmakers try different things. It was like a few years back, um, Clint Eastwood with Jersey Boys, you know, yeah, which yeah. again, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> um, yeah, and Eastwood, so. Eastwood himself is obviously, he's not, I don't think he's, he's tried on as many different genres as, as Spielberg or Scorsese, but, you know, he's done Westerns, dramas, action, war films. I mean, I think that's what makes these filmmakers from that era, Eastwood being a little bit older than them, obviously. Um, I think that's what makes these filmmakers so rich. And God, I'm so grateful that they're still, sorry, but the sun is changing here in LA, as you can see in my nose <laughs> blowing. Um, I think that's what makes them so rich and even unique in this era uh, of the, the types of blockbuster films we do get nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Um also, you mentioned when we were talking about the, uh, and, and thank you for all of that, by the way, amazing information there. But when we were talking about the, um, uh, you know, the scene in the in the laundrette with the phone call and stuff, you mentioned about that um, being part of the reshoot. And that's why I bought this particular picture up, because um, that yeah. I believe that the trying to push across the train tracks was the other um added scene that they did to make it theatrical length well there were Is that there right? were four scenes of uh, four added scenes um two of them were stephen's conception and two of them were george's george Eckstein, the producer um stephen's was the opening when um get my hand in the shot when um the uh, david pulls out of the um you know domesticity and he he leaves it behind driving through the city yes it starts to grow more rural um and then into the into the film proper from the, the television version, and then his other scene was the truck trying to push the the car in, yeah. into the train, and then George's was the uh, laundrette and the um, the bus sequence when the bus the school bus is um, sorry I smile when I think of that sequence I love it yeah yeah just the kids on the bus and some of the shots that Stephen gets and the um, the faces I mean you know obviously he's always been brilliant with children. Um, just a great, great director of children, one of the best in film history. Um, great. And I think that's that says something special about his character as a, a human being. That what little I've seen personally, but also you know throughout the decades in the media, and um, it's just that empathy. Um, and uh, I just love that. It's it's a scene that I think uh, hopefully people have the chance to see the theatrical cut someday, proper. Um, the, or excuse me, the television cut because it's I I do prefer that because it's it's lean, and okay. um, I wish I wish he'd even go back. Um, I know a lot of people don't like director's cuts these days, but I'm of the mind as long as the original TV cut and the theatrical cut were out there, do it like he did Close Encounters, which I think is a gift having the three major iterations. Um, I'd love to see him go back to the TV cut and strip out some of the uh, voiceover that he didn't want and the network yeah. and, and pushed him. Uh, he and George Eckstein didn't want it. The network pushed him to mm -hmm. have it. Why not play it as a silent picture? Even that long tracking shot, handheld tracking shot, 
yeah. where David goes back into the bathroom in, in uh, Chuck's cafe. Get rid of the, yeah. you know, it, I, it's, it's I, I on always, the nodes. Yeah, I always thought that that was a bit unnecessary. Um, you know, if I had to be nitpicky about it, and uh, but you, you know, I understand that you know the network wanted that to make to to, to make the uh, six year old kids that were watching uh, understand it, right? <laughs> yeah, but I, I think I think that's like underestimating your audience, including children, younger people, kids, um, because it's like you know. Oh boy, here you are again, back in the jungle. It's like that's the author, the writer. Not, not, not dissing on Matheson at all, but that is such a writerly thing. Has David experienced life in the jungle before this? I, I mean, possibly he's been bullied since he was a kid, maybe. But um, it's not needed. We see what's happening. There's, it's okay to just have sound effects sometimes. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. yeah. So I would love. Well, to like I said, I, I wanted that TV version you know in in it four three with a mono soundtrack on the on the blu-ray as well and there's no reason why they couldn't have put that on as well but hey yeah they didn't it has um, been broad it has been broadcast in the uk though i know because i uh i have a copy from uk broadcast of the television version oh right okay so well, I, I, keep an eye out. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say i'm not sure which one i saw by the way um we we, we do have a few people um watching us live um but i thought ah, we're not babbling into the void no, 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 I, I, thought, I thought maybe because my branding isn't working i wasn't getting any um any of the stream however we do have a um uh andy lunn here has said that fine dennis we the mustache oh. is why our family growing up always said he looked like my uncle Howard and was why I always watched it whenever it was on TV. So there you go. Thank um, you, Andy. That's, that's a nice, that's a nice story. And I got to say, um, I would have killed to talk to Dennis Weaver for this book. Um, first, I love talking to actors um, as a filmmaker for one, but also um, they bring such a, obviously a uh, unique perspective to the um retelling the story of any production but you know he he unfortunately passed some time ago but i i was fortunate to talk to his widow and what a sweet sweet lady she is i'm not shocked because he seemed like a good man and i've never i've never heard a bad word said against dennis weaver and that's that's a good way to leave the planet i think so yeah. um andy that was really nice i i love i mean that's that's part of the movies isn't it we we associate um we associate with the people up on the screen we see our shared humanity even if somebody is totally different than than us and that's one thing i love about like people say i i don't see myself on the screen i don't want to see myself on the screen i don't <laughs> there's one character in history that i in any film that i have related to like that i want to see people from all over i want to see people with mustaches i could never be manly enough to have i just i i love that that's what that's what movies are about shared Amen. humanity yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, no, that that that's that's fantastic. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, of course, with Dennis Weaver, uh, who you mentioned there. So uh, I know, you you know, the the network, ABC or whoever it was, what kind of wanted him because of the success with the McLeod and Gunsmoke and whatever um, TV movies. But Spielberg was excited because of the role in touch of evil is that right yeah which is which is i think really insightful as a director and um no i think it's i think it's a good thought because you look at him in um god i can't remember the character's name but you look at him in touch of evil and it's like that's david mann without hope <laughs> that that son of a gun is so squirrely in touch of evil and and spielberg looked at it and he thought you know that's 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 the the simmering underneath that's david mann like pushed into a corner and hopeless i'm going to walk that back a bit and we're going to get the perfect performance from from this actor which i think he did i i don't think there's anything that rings untrue in in weaver's performance in duel i think it's it's just besides the unnecessary overdubs which you know the internal monologues <laughs> okay oh, well, they're, they're, they're all coming I, out of the woodwork now so jason yeah. finn here has put uh, hello, Jason. Which Columbo episode featured Dennis Weaver as himself, who turned out to be the murderer? Well, I really hope you're going to tell us what the answer is, Jason, because I don't know. <laughs> Good, because I'm I'm not versed in Columbo enough. I've seen Stephen's <laughs> episode, Murder by the Book, 
so many times it's not even funny. And I will tell you, if you've not seen Murder by the Book, A, it, again, it's a great film, no matter who directed it. And B, the villain in that, and I'm not spoiling anything because um, the villains are, you know them right away in Columbo. And it's a matter of Columbo and, format. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> Jack Cassidy, father of um, the once hugely popular in the 1970s, Sean Cassidy and, and David Cassidy. And um, Jack Cassidy, is, it's one of my favorite performances in any of Stephen's films. He is so oily and self-sure of himself. And to see Lieutenant Columbo take him down in that episode is just wonderful. It's, it's a great performance. Um, he's, he's a scenery chewer of the highest order, and I just love it. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, I'm hoping Jason's got the answer to that because I'd like to know. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, to Internet Movie Database we go. I don't there, like there we Dennis Weaver. I like Dennis Weaver as a hero, a modest hero, not a masculine hero. But I, I don't want him to be a villain. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Even though in Touch of Evil, you know, yeah. I, I don't know if I'd say he's a villain, but he's he's on that side because he's untrustworthy and. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, one of the things, one of the other things I want to touch a little bit on while we're um, while we're on here, you know, and I've got the the luxury of uh, having some of your time, and 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 I just think it's interesting. Is I do, um, you know, Jewel is exp is influenced. Even you know, like I said, I'm a I love driving, I love road trips, I love cars, you know, all of this sort of thing. But also, it's it's, it's definitely influenced some of the films and whatever that I've made and, and I'm oh, making cool. there's been influences in there but I'm looking at other filmmakers and and, and things that <laughs> Jewel has influenced and uh one, one for start <laughs> is, is is Breakdown um which Jewel I was like any other beat name. Jonathan <laughs> Mustow actually when he was uh, uh shortly after he made this but um you, you know so, some 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 of these influences have been more successful than others but there was breakdown. There was also the, uh, the 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 joyride, or over here in the UK, it's called Roadkill. Actually, the Roadkill or Joyride <laughs> franchise it definitely um, changes the um, by J.J. Abrams. Somebody, yeah, J.J. Abrams with, with the late Paul Walker and Stephen yeah. Zahn um, acting it out. But again, th these these are ones that have definitely been, I think, influenced by Jewel, but not not in a way where they've like ripped it off it's it they, they've worked as movies in Part, themselves yeah 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 i mean they're 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 different stories under themselves but the matheson influences i mean you look at i mean even um george romero i'm a fanatic for george romero's right, work yeah and um and i would say actually you kind of started getting towards this and i was off on a tangent um george romero more than steven in some ways was one of the big influences on me thinking I can make movies because Steven stuff is just, even from a young age, I was just like, how does he do it? You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and I, I, I don't think I'm that type of filmmaker. I could never make a picture like him, which I like. I like looking at things that aren't like the stuff I do. Um, I don't, th he's, he's one of a kind, I think, but um, yeah. Uh, Romero with Night of the Living Dead, of course, hugely Love influenced it. by Matheson and yeah, yeah. I am legend. So. Yeah. Oh no! Absolutely. Ab 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 absolutely amazing stuff there. So, uh, yeah. And and uh, oh, a bit of trivia as well about the road, uh, the the Joyride franchise. Joyride as it is in the states, Roadkill as it is over here. They did have a sequel or a number of sequels, and I think the third one or something was called Joyride Roadkill. Right. So does that mean over here it's called Roadkill Roadkill? <laughs> who knows that's weird but, um, <laughs> not to put too fine a point on the title <laughs> there you go absolutely but the most the most egregious um one <laughs> is probably this film from 2015 called wrecker okay, okay that came out after the book because i did not know that um yeah it, it's it's a canadian film and it is essentially it's not shot by shot but it's certainly a a scene by scene remake of Duel, but the difference is instead of it being a uh, middle aged um, traveling salesman, it actually features two uh, girls in their 20s on a road trip. And instead of it being a um, tanker truck, it's actually a tow truck. 
But yeah. other than that, and it, of course, it's set that they're driving a red. Um, I think it's a red Mustang. It's set contemporary, and it's and and instead of California, it's it's Canada. But essentially, the um, it's. A, I'm assuming being a uh, tow truck, you see the driver in the film. No, because the windows are really dirty. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And is it a? Um, do we have any indication? Like in Duel, we can presume it's a man because, I mean, not that a woman couldn't wear those boots. And, and everything but no we see the hand that's if a woman has the hand of the trucker in duel she's a hefty now, lady <laughs> it's, it's set up exactly the same way i mean it's 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 it if it, it really is a, a cheap knockoff of of duel yeah it doesn't hold well, up but essentially i guess all um, of the by asking about is, it, is the aggressor male or female do we have any indication of that because uh, i like the idea of reversing the, it being females but if it's a male aggressor you know that we see it psychologically that's obviously strong that's why so many females are victims in films because men are aggressive women you know not not as much so stereotypically so there's a fear from the audience we worry about the females and so but if it was a female chasing females so do you have any indication who the aggressor is i guess is my uh, well they, they do the same because you know in this because it's contemporary as well they happen to be in an area that's got no cell coverage obviously that's, conveniently yeah. but they do stop it it's it's not chuck's cafe but they do stop <laughs> in a cafe and they have the same mm. looking at the boots of of all the guys at the bar and 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 oh. and you know <laughs> and a truck drives away outside and they go running after it and it's essentially it literally does take the story and the film. And, and I, I said, I got it because I was just fascinated. I was like, uh, I'm going to, this is like a German DVD, I think, because it's not widely mm. available everywhere, but yeah, I'm, just... I'm almost tempted to look at it. I just, I, I think um, it would be exciting if they did something with the gender politics. So um, because, you know, dual pits man against man and um, uh, man against woman is, is easy so it'd be interesting if they did something more interesting with the gender is there any subtext in that movie or is it just does it exist just to rip off duel i, I think i mean I, you, you know I, I i don't there's there's no um commentaries or, or or documentaries or anything with the filmmakers so i, I really don't know um but uh, essentially the plot is identical um <laughs> as i said they've just changed it out from being a a middle-aged guy to two, you know, girls in their late twenties or whatever on a road trip. Um, but all the all the same beats happen. Um, even the conclusion is the same, exactly the same. So, I'm surprised. Um, Does Universal yeah. have a hand in it at all? No, I don't think so. No, I mean it, 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 it's it's yeah, law, lawsuit. <laughs> but uh, I would think. Um, Although, you know, we've seen similar types of films so many times, but um, it, it, it made me think. I Obviously, I didn't know about this until just now, but um, with Hollywood's propensity to remake everything under the sun, especially thrillers and horror films from the 70s we've seen over the last decade plus, I'm surprised we've never heard anyone threaten to remake Duel. Yeah. Which is kind of like, uh, officially, it's like, well, what's the point? The film still plays perfectly i think minus you know like you said the cars and the dress so um i'm surprised that hasn't happened yet and eh, why bother <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely absolutely the other thing um we i guess we need to talk about while we're talking about dual and celebrating its 50th anniversary but i will start with a caveat before i go into this so <laughs> um i i've been lucky enough to meet and i've actually had him on the podcast for an interview uh, Kenneth Johnson, who, uh, again, is a name that I grew up with as a kid because he was sure. the uh, producer of the Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman and later V and Alien Nation and, and, and you know, properties of that nature. But he did actually, um, uh, you know where I'm going with this, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Let, yeah. Let and I talked, with, I talked with Kenny for the book. Extraordinarily life, nice man. I think... Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't want to speak out of um, private conversation. Well, private represented in the book, but he seemed a little bit reticent at first 
And I, I don't know. I don't, I think maybe it's because I'm sure he's been asked so many times about this. Um, he didn't mean any offense to Steven or his film. I know Steven took, young Steven took quite a bit of umbrage at it, but yeah. that yeah, was so the, I, I think, as he says in, in my book, that that was the universal way at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in case, in case the, like listeners or viewers don't know what we're talking about here, <laughs> essentially the um, universal, uh, that the own um, dual, uh, a lot of the second unit, and action shots used to be used for episodic television to basically give episodic television more of a budget than, 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 than what it had. And these sort of things were done. And there was an episode of The Incredible Hulk, which is a series that I'm a, a massive fan of. Uh, you know, again, I grew up with it uh, when it was eventually shown here in the UK and, and I love the show. Um, and interesting enough, this is actually probably one of the worst episodes <laughs> of The Incredible Hulk because tonally it's very different um, to everything else. It, the, the, they play this kind of music that almost sounds like it should be in Dukes of Hazard, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's got this real kind of humorous tone that, that the, the show didn't normally have because the show, even though it's about a, a guy who turns into a, a, a you know, a green monster, uh, other than that, the show was actually quite, took itself quite seriously. And, um, you know, Kenneth Johnson, a very, you know, talented um, writer and filmmaker, you know, you know, would make them uh, allegories for, um, for for real domestic things and important things, but but this yeah. episode not so much. And essentially, so what they did is they they structured a story um, around all of the action sequences from Jewel, so that they could use the the same car and the same truck, which again I guess were on the Universal lot and. You know, tie it in with Bill Bixby and and Lou Ferrigno and whatever. Uh, you know, hulking out and and putting some Hulk action in there as well. But uh, <laughs> you know, I feel that uh, yeah. it, it it needed to be mentioned if we if we're sort of having a deep dive in into Duel. Um, but uh, yeah, I know Spielberg was not happy and actually got something put in his contract beyond that that they couldn't use any of his films yeah. for. Uh, <laughs> And uh, that's a substantial, the, the whole Hulk episode is a substantial sidebar in, in the book. And um, I think yeah, I read Stephen, uh, yeah, Steve, oh, that's true. You have. Thank you again. <laughs> um, Stephen uh, has always been a big television fan. So he, he happened upon the episode and was like, son of a, you know. And I think he said um, he, he got that clause put into his contract because he didn't want to see parts of Close Encounters or, or something show up on Laverne and Shirley. That's yeah. funny. Funny. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I remember. I mean, a, again, a, a show I grew up on, um, starring Lee Majors, The Fall Guy, oh, and sure. of course, because because that was about a stuntman bounty hunter. Yeah, they would. It was kind of again. It was sort of Hooper meets Hunter, wasn't it? Kind of thing. That yeah. you know, the, the <laughs> Larson uh, thing. But uh, you, you know, because they couldn't really afford the stunts that was the premise of the show, they would take bits from other universal or Fox or whatever it was at the time properties. And I remember there was one episode that was uh, literally like Capricorn one and they took all of the action, the helicopter scenes, and then they had like Lee Majors kind of dressed up similar to what James Brolin was, was wearing in that, in those scenes. And uh, is it a helicopter in. sequence in that, like a funky helicopter? I haven't looked at it in years, but yeah, they were like they were like sort of black helicopters that chased him across okay. the desert. And uh, I just kind of again these things sort of stick in your mind from childhood, and yeah. I I remember that they 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 kind of did that. So it was something that they used to do back in the day. And uh, oh, Universal uh, especially. I mean, you look at Universal and Paramount, obviously, were the huge companies for television at that time wisely so because you know by the 1950s the the studio era was um dying and so they had these deep deep libraries and you know the studios especially universe from its earliest days it wasn't a major studio it was um it wasn't like poverty row obviously it was a mini major for the longest part of its its career or uh, life i should say until um 
MCA came in and changed a lot of things with Lou Wasserman and then Sid Scheinberg. But no, they don't see, they didn't see um, most of their assets as art. And I don't think the studios still do. It's, it's a business. And so Fall Guy was a pretty, from a, um, what's the word now, a content perspective. Everybody likes to say content. That's a pretty brilliant conceit to give feature film quality to a television series. Like, just yeah. like you were saying, they would take stunts from the features and then, and the series was wrapped around that. So, um, you know, um, I could see where a filmmaker, like in Steven's case, he made a TV movie only to have it cannibalized for television. Um, that's that's got to be infuriating. But um, no, I mean, even um, well, Raiders of the Lost Ark uses parts of other films. Um, it uses a shot from the Hindenburg, which was only, I want to say, less than a decade old at that point. So it's it's something that's been done regularly where, unfortunately, feature films with studios sometimes do become stock assets and not the films unto themselves. But um, in the case of what was done with Duel, obviously, and, and what Fall Guy would do too, that they were egregious in their oh. strip mining. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and it's such a shame because as I said, um, Hulk is, The Incredible Hulk is such a great show, but that particular episode, apart from, you know, stealing all of the Duel elements, uh, it is not very good. I mean, it, 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 it's totally really weird as i said the the musical soundtrack that accompanies it seems like it's from a different show altogether and 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 uh and also they they have some terrible process shots for the uh for the interior <laughs> driving bits where again yeah. they've, got, they've got the gut you know uh bill bixby's wearing a a, a a sky blue shirt like this to try and match dennis weaver's look and uh <laughs> You know, and and and, and but he bait. didn't have the mustache. He didn't have the mustache. That is true. That is true. Talking of the mustache, um, Jason, you've really let us down, Jason. He said, you know, this this question, and I said, well, have you got the answer? Can't find it. Maybe it was another detective show. So maybe murder. She wrote. Maybe he tried to to off someone uh, under Jess. Uh, what's her name? Jessica something's watch. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. Uh, who who knows? Who knows? But uh, but yeah. So um, y you know that that's uh, it's it's been fascinating to dig into this. I mean, I'm sure there's so much to talk about here. But what I would encourage people to do um, out there is absolutely see Jewel. Um, oh yeah, it is available on on home media, and I will put links in the show notes below as to where you can you know buy it and watch it um on blu-ray or, or dvd but also more importantly if you're interested in spielberg's career and you're interested in 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 the making of this film there's no better source of information than than your book basically Stephen. so uh Thank you, Keith. Again, i'll put a link to that in the show notes below but um please you know check out uh spielberg in dual uh the the making of a film career by Stephen A. Walt. And uh, you, you can, you can find all the information in there, but uh, is there anything Thank else, you. Stephen, that you want to promote while, um, while well, we're here? Um, the opportunity? Uh, I, I've been working on a number of things right after the dual book. I, um, I researched and talked with everybody except for, I still need to talk to Stephen and, John Williams about it. I was starting uh, working on a, a book on the Sugarland Express, Stevens, uh, sadly un, unseen and even unknown in a lot of ways, 1974 film. It was, um, he did Duel and then he did two other television films, Something Evil and um, uh, Savage. And then um, the Sugarland Express was technically his first feature film made directly for cinemas. And mm -hmm. then um, after Sugarland, he moved on to uh, Jaws. So um, Sugarland's a really excellent film if you haven't seen it, the Sugarland Express. Um, I still plan to get something made of, I mean, I've got wonderful interviews with Goldie Hawn, um, William Atherton, uh, Michael Sachs, and um, uh, Vilma Sigmund. Um, he passed not long after. Um, I think I might have one of his la later, if not final interview. Um, just a lot of the people on the cast and crew and I have had trouble finding a publisher interested in it because, I mean, even finding a publisher for the dual book was hard, which is shocking. Really? But then, um, 
that's on a back burner at the moment because I've been commissioned to write from a new publisher two other books on Amblin Entertainment properties from um, the the first decade, uh, the 1980s, big films that are quite beloved. Uh, I can't announce those yet though because they're not yet announced. Um, but in the meantime, I've also been helping edit a couple books. Um, we just had one come out on the, the first three Jurassic Park films that's available right now from Insight Editions. Um, oh, wow, okay. the, yeah, it's the Jurassic Park Ultimate Visual History. That's a very good book. And then um, before Christmas holiday, we um, were wrapping up the, um, the work on uh, an ET book by um, uh, uh, Kathleen Gaines wrote it. A oh, wow. really good author. Yeah. And um, he did a, a, a very fine job on, on the book, I think. And um, I'm excited for that to come out uh, in 2022. I don't, I don't remember the exact date, but it's been announced. Um, and um, yeah, for that'll the be coming out. Yeah, for the yeah, anniversary. Correct, correct. Right. Yeah, correct. A lot of anniversaries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, unfortunately, yeah, uh, that, 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 the, the more time goes on, the more of these come around, isn't it? So uh, yeah, yeah. I'm glad um, we so I get that join. Those are the two that have been announced. Um, I'm also working right now, and this is a million to one shop, but I'm working on a pitch for a graphic novel and um, making of on a, or quasi making of, a non-making of making of on a, uh, an unproduced Spielberg film. Um, and uh, we're working on um, a, a pitch for that right now. Um, the, uh, the publisher is interested in it, but we need to see if Steven gives it the okay. So hopefully we get that in front of him in the next year because it's a project I'm really excited about, especially as I see the art coming in on the graphic novel side, we're doing a nine page sample. Um, so okay. hopefully that entices without saying too much. And then finally, personally, um, apart from my, my work as a film historian or work for Amblin, um, if you follow me on um, Stephen, uh, at Stephen A. Walt on Twitter, at um, A-W-A-L-T is how my last name spelled, Stephen with a B. Um, or I'm also on Facebook. Um, I talk about cinema there a lot. And um, I have, I mentioned before, my first um, film playing in a festival is uh, The Mundanity of the Christ. It's going to be playing, uh, it's a comedy, uh, playing at the, um, the Great Canadian Comedy Film Festival. Um, it's going to be available online uh, with a number of other comedy shorts. I want to say it's the week of December 3rd. So okay. um it's a ticketed um, festival, but a um, lot of lot of comedy there. I haven't seen the, the other films yet, but I, I'm rather fond of my own film. I think my actors are really great in it. Um, it's a silly, silly film about Jesus Christ reincarnated working in a uh, modern office uh, setting. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I wish you luck with that. I mean, if, if you've, uh, if you send me the link, I'll be sure to add it to the the um oh, show you. details and I'll, so I'll, I'll send you a link i'll send you a link to the uh the film itself if you want to see it it's it's a short silly thing lovely i promise i won't share that so because you won't oh, be yeah yeah the festival, right? <laughs> right. yeah not not since it's on the fest <laughs> circuit right now i can't put it out there for everyone no, yet but um in, in time i will and it's it's essentially it's a, a short pitch for what i hope to be a, a proposed comedy series um oh, streaming right. or television Fantastic. And of course, I, you know, it would be wrong of me not to mention this as well, but you actually do appear in the documentary, um, The Shark is Still Working, uh, right? Yeah. The, 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 the yeah. Jaws. The, on the Jaws Blu ray. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, um, I'm also in the, um, the dual documentary I mentioned that, that the, the gents from Spain and Europe um, and a, a couple of the filmmakers are from the UK. Um, that's called The Devil on Wheels. And um, they have social presence if you want to follow um, what's going on with their film and, and where it's going to screen and, and hopefully wind up on home video eventually. Um, that, was a, that was a nice experience. Uh, both sets of filmmakers on those documentaries are good people. And they, I think they made some fine films for um, two of the best films uh, we have in our collective film history. No, oh, definitely, definitely. No, I, as I said, I have I have spoken to one of the uh, producers on that, and uh, it was kind of like, oh my god, is there anything I can do on that? Because you know, I love that film. So, well, I I think they're <laughs> looking for it. This is a good plug for them. I think they are looking for financial support. You could help them ah, with that if you're if you're able. And, and the the, 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 the one thing viewers. I probably can't offer, yeah. <laughs> no, and it's I know it's it's these but, are uh, these are tough times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Now that that's fantastic. Um, so any anything else? Uh, you know, I, I want to give you while, while we're live on the platform. If there's anything uh, else, you pretty much. I covered. think that's it. I mean, that's a lot. Um, a lot of things yet unannounced as far as me as a writer myself. <clears throat> Besides, of course, um, Amblin.com and uh, and Amblin social media. You can find my writing there constantly. Um, but as far as the books, um, hopefully, hopefully things are uh, on my books as a writer are hopefully we'll see in late 2022 early 23 now um but uh also check out the Jurassic Park and ET books that I helped edit oh, um for they're, sure they're special. yeah yeah well I mean you know may, may, maybe uh you know it's been great to have you on this maybe we can have you back well, at you. some time you, you know to talk about those things or something at a later date maybe um I can well, see you've you. got I've gone wide on this because I can see you've got your ET clock back there is is it and you've got your that's a hideous indiana that's jones. a hideous piece <laughs> and you've got your Indi indiana jones uh and the temple of doom is it poster there on the on the side yeah yeah yeah, yeah so. this is my uh this is my office that i i work in um at home i i do most of my writing here and um so it's it's highly decorated with uh amblin things and uh i've got shelves of steven's work and reference books and everything so this is my little Amblin room um, for my my work with the with the company. Fair enough. Well, listen, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you, today. Keith. I've thoroughly enjoyed um, you know chatting about something that I'm very passionate about, and it's so good to uh, speak with someone that's so knowledgeable and involved in and everything with that. So this has been fantastic. Um, thank you for those of you who have watched this, whether you've been watching live or or you've discovered it later. Um, I really appreciate your your uh, time with this. If you've got any comments or anything, please put it in the section below and we'll try and answer it. And please do check out the links to Stephen's work and everything in the show notes below this as well. Um, please check out the rest of the content on this channel as well. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of physical media reviews. There is indeed one for Jewel, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, any questions or anything you've got relating to those as well, uh, please drop me a line. I always try and answer everything. And uh, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you want to check out my filmmaking work, I have a separate channel called British Isles. That's E-Y-L-E-S, as in my last name. And there's half Whatever. a dozen... <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's half a dozen mm. short films that I made there. Um, uh, if you want to check those out, and again, any any feedback and comments, etc., are really welcome. But um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, my normal outro with our branding isn't working for some reason. So I'm going to take this opportunity now to say thank you to you, thank you again, Stephen, and we'll uh, see you at the next home media minefield. Bye for now. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.